Zão.
Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Isn't it wonderful you can come to church in the middle of the week and just have such a wonderful move of God? We don't serve a dead God. We don't, we don't have a dead religion. We don't have a dead lifestyle in Christ. Thank God. He's so awesome, so wonderful. Oh, praise God, praise God. Oh, hallelujah, Lord, hallelujah. I got some announcements. Um, ladies' prayer will be canceled this week. They will resume next week. Uh, too many of our ladies are going to be out of town and un unable to attend. But if you want to come to the church and pray, you can come to the church and pray. We ain't going to stop nobody from praying. Father's Day breakfast, Sunday at 9 a.m. For all you fathers that want to get your grub on, come on out. Life groups are Thursday night, June the 23rd. And we are going to receive our offering. Praise God. Thank you, Holy Ghost. We love you tonight, Lord. We worship you tonight. Ah, yes, Lord. Thank you for the manifestation of your presence tonight, oh God. Thank you, Lord, for the reign of the Holy Ghost that we have felt in this house already, God. We worship you tonight, God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. You can be seated for a few minutes. I'll have you stand back up in a few uh, for the reading of the word. A couple of things I just want to discuss real quick, hopefully real quick. Children, you can be dismissed at this time for your children's class. I think that's ages 5 to 11 or 5 to 12, 5 to 11, I think. I don't know. I just passed her here. But nonetheless, I don't know. Nonetheless, so if you got a child here and you're new here tonight, you can let your children go back there if you like to. They, they will treat them right. We appreciate Brother Glenn and Sister Taylor here. Amen, amen. One of the many hats they wear. And whatever they do, they do it faithfully, and they do it well. And I thank God for that. Amen. Amen, amen. Just to uh, give you guys a, a little bit of what's going on. Well, first of all, for the life group, uh, they are on Thursday nights. We're doing them once a, once a month. And uh, the leaders over the life groups will be the Phelps will be over. Brother and Sister Phelps will be over theirs. Brother and Sister Roy will be over theirs. And we don't call them Brother and Sister White. Brother Glenn and Sister Taylor will be over theirs. <laughs> They don't, they just, I, I joke with them all the time, but they're, I'm going to be careful. Oh, I'm going to say it. They're too young to give them last names. So that, they know what that says about the rest of you. <laughs> Sorry, it's just a joke. But nonetheless, um, they will be the leaders over those three groups. And so if you have any questions about where the group will be, what time it will meet, what you need to bring, go to them, not to me. That was the goal this whole time is to release that totally and completely into those groups. 
And uh, if they, they can determine who will facilitate the meeting, if they do it or let somebody else do it. But, uh, and and on, we want to have them on Thursday nights, but if for some reason your group decides that's a terrible night that week, then go ahead and have it on another night. Uh, so it's okay if, if you absolutely cannot do it on that night, but we want to, as much as possible, hold them uh, to having them on Thursday nights. Also, Sister Dorothy, I mean, I've been keeping in touch with you on the church page, but she's basically, um, she's at the end. She um, hasn't, hasn't been able to eat or drink anything for close to 48 hours, and so it's just a waiting game. They're just waiting on her to pass. She's 86 years old. She's run her race, and she's ready to go home. Amen. And, and, it, and uh, Brother Tom, her son-in-law, said she was writhing in pain in the bed the other day, and, and uh, he just reached over and grabbed her hand and just started praying, and the peace of God just flooded that entire room, and she started praying. This was before she was unresponsive. Started praying, and just the peace of God just flooded that entire room, and she just calmed right back down. So amen, amen. That's awesome. That's what you want. When you get to the end of the road, you want a peaceful exit. That's usually a good sign. <laughs> And uh, nonetheless, we, uh, we don't know. There will not be a funeral here at the church. It'll just be a graveside service. I'll keep you posted. Uh, she hasn't passed yet, but it could be any day. Uh, so just prepare yourselves for that because, um, it'll, like I said, it won't be here. It'll be in the, at the graveside here in town. But if you can make it out to that, and we'll announce whenever that all happens. I can't imagine her lasting much more than a day or two, but I don't know. She's tough. She's one tough cookie. I promise you that. If she wants to live another two weeks, she'll live with no food, no water, just because she don't want to let go. She's tough. If you don't know her, you, you just don't understand how tough she is. Amen. So um, also, um, Michelle, she, uh, Sister Michelle was on the church page today. And so if we can get some folks to help out with this, the yard needs to be cleared out. They're going to be putting a building uh, with electricity running to it. She's going to have air conditioning in it on, uh, on her friend's property. And we're going to go in there and help her clear that property out. I'm sure she would not be against some of us going Friday evening if you have time. But if not, Saturday morning around 9 a.m. Would that be okay, Sister Michelle? Around 9 a.m.? Please don't think she has all the help in the world and you don't need to go. If you can help, please come help. Doesn't matter if you're a girl, boy, man, woman. We, we got a lot to do out there. Just move stuff around. And we want to help her out as much as possible. Amen? Amen. Thank God. So we're excited about that. She's finding a place to go and live. And we're excited. Thank you, Brother John and Sister Yvonne, for helping her all this time. That's the body of Christ. Amen. Where'd Brother John go? I don't even see him in here anymore. Brother Tillman, is he in here? He might be out. He might have stepped out for a second. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we're going to open up the scriptures tonight. I'm going to preach on believing on the Lord. What does it mean? Believing on the Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you tonight, Lord Jesus. God, we ask you, Lord, to help us tonight to, to get into the Word of God and be able to discern, Lord, the truths of your Word tonight, God. Lord, we ask you to help us open our understanding, God. Let the will of God be done. Let the anointing of the Holy Ghost help us tonight. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. You can stand for the reading of the Word, John chapter 3, verses 14 through 18. John chapter 3, verses 14 through 18. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. Oh, I wish we could get that across our thick skulls. While we all get righteous and love to condemn the world. Let me tell you one thing. When Jesus came on the earth, there was, there was some wickedness. There was perversity. There was filthiness. There was homosexuality. There was uh, people shacking up, people fornicating, adulterating. I mean, it was filthy back then, too. They just didn't have the same uh, avenues that we have today, maybe. But I promise you, it was filthy. But he said he didn't come to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. 
If your goal is only to condemn the world but not save the world, you are not operating in the spirit of Jesus Christ. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You can be seated. Thank you, Jesus. Where's Brother Cole at? I don't see. Okay, I just want to make sure you don't go too far. I'll have you. His help here in a few minutes. Amen. Well, I just want to say thank you to all of you that are so faithful to Calvary United. Uh, I looked at our monthly commitments today, and I think it's about $1,200 we have coming in each month on top of our uh, first fruits offering. And I just want to say thank you to all of you that are being a part of that. Amen. Yes, give yourself a hand clap. Absolutely. And uh, we had a meeting with the engineers last week, and so they're going to take a stab at it and see what we can do. They said it'll be tight, but I said, hey, look, I don't care if we got to tear this building down and build something else. We are putting something on this property. Amen. And they said, well, another church wanted to do something. We told them we couldn't do nothing unless they tore theirs down. He said, but we're willing to take a stab at yours and see if we can add something on back here. And so we, it, don't get excited because engineers, they take their time. So it could be another month or a month and a half before we hear anything. They've got to draw up the plans, bring it before the city, and uh, we, they've got to do all that. It's just a step-by-step -step process. Amen. But I thank God for everybody that is giving to that endeavor, and it is, it's being blessed. I'll just say that. Amen. Thank God. John chapter 3. Amen. Jesus is dealing with a whole lot of issues right here in the book of John chapter 3. We know that in the beginning of John chapter 3, Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night, and, and he's a very religious man. He's an upright man. He's not a bad man. He's, he's not a wicked man. He's a good man. He follows the law of Moses. He keeps all the ordinances. He's a Pharisee. He's a ruler of the Jews. He's, he's a head honcho in the, in the Jewish religion. But he, he, he senses something is missing in all of his goodness and in all of his religion, something isn't quite right. You ever felt that way? Your life was great, everything's wonderful, but you know, you can't point to nothing bad, but something's just off. You're just not really happy even though you lay down to go to bed and you sleep in a three or $400,000 home and you might drive a $60,000 vehicle. You might have $80,000 in the bank. I don't know what you got. You might not. But I'm just saying that you can have all those things and even be a churchgoer and just realize something's not right. Now, the wonderful thing about Nicodemus, he realized whenever something was off, Instead of running to the temple to recheck his religious traditions, he ran to Jesus, who was different. <laughs> he, something about this Jesus grabbed his attention, and guess what? It wasn't his religion. Jesus didn't come preaching a new religion, but he came demonstrating the power of the Holy Ghost. He came loving people, being compassionate to people, healing people, delivering people, casting devils out of people. Let me tell you, this old world is tired of seeing dead, dry religion. They want to see a move of God. They want to know if their cousin can get baptized in Jesus' name and have their sins washed away. They want to know if mama can get rid of that old devil that's been plaguing her for the last 30 years. They want to know if their child can get off of the Oxycontin and quit smoking dope and quit drinking alcohol they want to see somebody radically transformed that's what they want to see and if we don't give it to them we might as well fold up camp and go home because we're not the church if that's not what we're doing I'm not condemning ourselves but I refuse to settle into being just a church that's going to have a good time and have a little few little goosebumps and just go about our business Hey, this isn't religion. This is a relationship. This is a move of God that we're in the middle of, and we're looking to change people's lives with the gospel, with the gospel. And so Nicodemus knows where to turn. It matters that you know who to turn to when you're discontent, when you're dissatisfied, when you're unhappy, when you're just miserable. It matters who you turn to. You know, I could turn to my wife and she can, she can supply some of the needs in my life emotionally and, 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 you know, she can fill some voids in my life. 
but she can't feel all of them. And I can't feel her voice. <laughs> she can't be distressed, and all of a sudden I just say, peace be unto you. And it come from me. <laughs> it comes from Jesus. It all comes from Jesus. And whatever you're going through tonight, you better learn how to turn to Jesus and believe on him. Put your faith in him. Trust him. Have confidence in him. Hallelujah. You better start believing on Jesus and trusting him the higher this gas goes. You better start trusting him. You better start believing him. You better start doing something because it ain't going down anytime soon from what they say. And neither is anything else. Amen. You, you see, Nicodemus turned to Jesus. And Jesus, you know what Jesus did? He dealt with his faith. He dealt, he dealt, he didn't, he didn't talk to him about anything. He just got right down to the crux of the matter. He said, here's, here's the situation, Nicodemus. You need to be born again. He just got right down. I love that about Jesus. We come to Jesus and we have all these ideas and all these reasons and all these things. We just run our mouths. And God says, well, let me tell you what the real problem is. Let me tell you what the real, I, I know you're blaming them, but let me tell you what the real problem is. I know you got hung up, you, you got hung up over there by that situation, but let me tell you what the real situation is here. He said, that's what I want. I want a God that's going to point me down to the real situation, to the root of the problem so I can get the solution. I want to be whole. I want to be made new. I don't want to live halfway for God. I want to live all the way for Jesus tonight. You see, it really doesn't matter what else we may or may not believe about the Word of God. If Jesus is not the central object of our belief and our faith, then everything else is obsolete. It's all obsolete. Our religion is obsolete. Our giving, our good deeds are obsolete if Jesus is not the reason for it. Jesus ought, Jesus ought to be the reason that we do everything that we do. Our faith in Jesus is what should compel me to love, to give, to serve, to forgive, to bless. It ought to be the reason for it all. I don't give to get. I give because Jesus, he's the reason I give. He's the reason I forgive. He's the reason I want to bless people because left to myself, I hoard it all to myself. Oh, I know y'all a lot better than me. I don't hurt it all. Well, I was just always such a giver. Well, let me break, it new, break some news to you, baby. I was always such a taker. I was spoiled, raised out of five kids. I was the last one, the caboose. They trusted me more than the other ones. That backfired. They gave me more rope than the other ones. I hung myself with it. I mean, <laughs> I know you was good, but I wasn't, you see? So anything good flows out of me. It's not make-believe. It really is Jesus. It really is him. Oh, I was raised right. I say yes, sir, no, sir. But that don't mean nothing if at the, rot at the very core of who you are, you're rotten. Manners don't cover up that mess. <laughs> Only Jesus can cover up that mess. Only Jesus. Hallelujah. Why don't you thank God right now and say, only Jesus can do that. <laughs> Hallelujah. Belief in Jesus has been grossly distorted in our day, and, and it's been dumbed down to simply saying, I believe in Jesus. Believing on Jesus Christ is far different than simply believing in Jesus such as believing that he existed, died, and was buried, rose again. Many folks believe that. You can go around this city tonight. You believe Jesus died, was buried, and rose again from the dead? Absolutely. You want to come to, you want to pray? No, I don't want to pray. Would you like a Bible study? Absolutely not. Well, <laughs> want to come to church? Nope, not interested. <laughs> you want to talk about God? No, not really. <laughs> I'd rather smoke a little weed. I'd rather go play my games. I'd rather go do something. They're not interested, but they believe. They believe he died for them, but they're not doing anything, anything about it. They believe he existed and did all that, but they may not be believing on Jesus. It's kind of like, I tell you what, Brother Cole, come here for a second. Now, before you do what I told you to do, give me a second. He makes me nervous. It's kind of like saying, you know, I really believe that chair can hold me up. Good looking chair, built well, read the label. So, Holds around 400 pounds. I know that for sure. Maybe more. I don't know. Good looking chair. I've seen, every, I've seen other people sit on it. I, I believe that chair can hold me up. I, I really believe that. 
In fact, I, I know for a fact that I, if I sit down in that chair, that that chair will hold my weight. But I'm not going to do it. Then I don't believe it. I don't care how much you say you believe that chair is going to hold your weight. It's not until you not only sit down on that chair, but you rest on that chair. And you take all your weight off, and you fully and completely and wholly lean on this chair. Do you really believe? <laughs> oh, yeah, I believe, I'm believing on the Lord. Mm -hmm. I'm believing on the Lord here, you know what I'm saying? Just, just in case, though, <laughs> you know, just in case, you know, just in case. Really believing on the Lord here, just, you know, halfway. Just, I won't really let, I won't really get comfortable. I won't really rest. You know, you, you know, one way to tell how you believe on the Lord, whatever you're going through, Cole, go ahead. Go ahead, just, just, how y'all doing? Y'all doing all right? God's good. It's going to wear him out. <sighs> and it feels good. <sighs> Just trust in God. You can stop. You know what most of us do, though? As soon as that starts, yo, hold on a second. We get off of that thing as quick as we can. And we love trusting and believing on the Lord until it starts getting rocky. And all of a sudden, we got to grab on to whatever's around us and hold on to something else because that's getting a little too rocky. It's, it's a little too shaky. It's a little bit uneven. I don't No, you can rest. Hey, you know, it was in that ark, and it, it went, went this way. It went that way. It went up. It went down. It about almost turned over, and he's just rocking with the waves. He's in the boat. He's in the boat. Noah didn't believe nothing until he got on that boat. And so believing on the Lord, I'm not talking about a prayer you pray. I'm talking about an action that you take. That's where the whole church world has gone wrong. They, they, they equate or they define believing on the Lord as a little prayer that you pray and then everything's fine. No, it's an action that you take. It's not just a little prayer that you say. It is a literal action that you take from the depths of your heart and you throw yourself on Jesus and you are willing to trust him, depend on him, rely on him, and here's the kicker, obey him. Uh, one of the definitions for belief is to think to be true, to be persuaded of, to credit, place confidence in, to entrust a thing to one. A conviction full of joyful trust that Jesus is the Messiah, the divinely appointed author of eternal salvation in the kingdom of God, conjoined with obedience to Christ. <laughs> conjoined. We, we live in a world that has dumbed it all down to a simple little, let me tell you one thing, I am never against anybody praying to God. Let me clarify that. <laughs> I'm not against it. What I'm against is telling them that's all there is. Tell them, okay, you're good. You're saved now. You're born again, saved. Everything's good. You're whatever. That, that's, now, if that's the case, the Word of God, I'd be all right with it. But, but I just see so much more in the Word of God. And believing on the Lord is not a cheap thing. It's not difficult. It's not complex. It's not unattainable. But neither is it this cheap, easy little thing you do on the way to, on the back store of the Tom Thumb. When you, you felt bad about doing whatever you did and somebody said, hey, if you pray this prayer, you're going to be saved. No, it's more than that. It's a good start to say, I need you, Jesus. <laughs> that's a wonderful start, but that's not the end. That is not the end. Amen. Hallelujah. If we're depending on, you see, the thing is, I'm not really believing on the Lord until I release my full weight and let him hold me up. That's, and I'm not just talking about, I'm not trying to approach this from a salvation issue, although it can affect your salvation. I'm talking about in your daily life, are you believing on the Lord? Are you believing on the Lord in your situation for your situation? Are you throwing your full weight on him and the full weight of your situation? Or, or are you holding it back and trying to carry it yourself? Because if you are, you're not believing on the Lord. Amen. Believing on Jesus is, is, is just basically... We're saying to him, Lord, I trust you. I trust you. I'm letting this go. 
I can find rest in you. I can find peace in you no matter what's going on around me. Amen. You, you know you're believing on Jesus when you find rest in times of trouble and peace in the midst of the storm. You see, believing on Jesus demands a response. It, it demands action. It's a verb, not a noun. It demands obedience to the gospel, which is obeyed through Acts 2.38, repentance, water baptism, in Jesus' name, and the infilling of the Spirit. However, I believe as apostolics, we've been too guilty of shying away from scriptures that talk about believing on the Lord because of how much it has been misinterpreted, interpreted, so we just stay as far away from it as we can. Let's not talk about those. Because we know you got to obey Acts 2.38. I'm Acts 2.38 through and through. But let me tell you one thing. Jesus puts a whole lot of stock into true believing. Because that's the only thing that's going to get somebody moving towards any kind of repentance, any kind of baptism, any kind of Holy Ghost. It's, it's got to start down right there with the believing part. It's got to start with the conviction that he really is God and that he died for my sins and I need to change my life. Hallelujah. I don't just need to acknowledge he did it. I need to put some gear into action and do something about it. Jesus hanging on the cross demanded action, demanded a response. Amen. Believing on the Lord is the foundation of Acts 2.38. The reason they ask the question in verse 37, men and brothers, what shall we do, is because they believe the message in verse 36 that Jesus was both Lord and Christ. It says then when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. In other words, they believed Jesus was the Messiah, that he had risen from the dead, which in turn caused them to take action. That's why they asked, what shall we do? Because Peter said that God has made that same Jesus, both Lord, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And immediately they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter didn't say believe on the Lord. He said, now you need to repent because you've already believed. You believe to the point of action. And so whatever in your life, if you claim you're believing God, if it doesn't move you to action, you're not believing on the Lord. If you're not truly believing yet, believing in something, is gonna, it's going to cause you to sit in that chair. It's going to cause you to take, pick your feet up and relax and rest in that chair. So many of us struggle with God and we fight with God. And I've been there before. But I'm telling you, when you're truly believing, you're going to find rest in Him. You're going to find peace in Him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now, when Jesus walked on the earth, He didn't preach Acts 2.38 because people were not ready for that. You know what He was doing? A lot of folks try to find it all in the Gospels, but Acts 2.38 is the culmination of the Gospel. That's what it is. The Holy Ghost had not yet been poured out when Jesus was on earth. Nobody was getting baptized in Jesus' name when he walked on the earth because it was not available yet. Jesus, what he was doing is preparing them. His, you know what Jesus' goal was when he walked the earth? To get the focus of everybody's faith off of the law of Moses. He was trying to get their faith away from the law and saying, if I do this, 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 I'm saved. If I do this, 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 and there ain't nothing wrong with doing things, that's fine. But believing the law was going to save them was not going to happen anymore. You know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah, they, they didn't need to start sinning. That wasn't the answer. <laughs> Jesus didn't come and say, well, never mind, guys, you want to commit adultery, you want to steal, you want to kill, go for it. It's not what he said. But what he was doing, he was trying to get the focus of their faith away from the works of the law and onto him, the all-sufficient sacrifice. The Bible said he fulfilled the law is what he did. And so that's what Jesus came to do, to move everybody's faith away from their religion to him. And if we are not careful, sometimes we put more faith in our religion than we do Jesus. We can all be, anybody can do it. Baptist, Catholic, Pentecost, trust me, none of us are exempt. We can all put more faith in our good deeds and how we act. And, well, you know, amen, you know, because we all, now the world is, well, live like a devil. Oh, he's going to hell. Oh, sweet mama, she's going to heaven. She ain't ever heard of mosquito. That's the general consensus, isn't it? Better place now. Oh, we know old Uncle Joe there. He. He was a good fellow. Oh, I know he cussed a little bit, but he was a good fellow, you know. 
And uh, he didn't, he didn't, I know he didn't, wasn't interested in God, but, you know, he was a good guy. Gave the shirt off his back, helped all them kids out in the neighborhood. We, we know he's in a better place. Well, I hope he is, but that's not the gospel. That's just not the gospel. Amen. I hope Brother Uncle Joe is. I ain't, I ain't against Uncle Joe. And I ain't talking about Joe Biden either. I'm just talking about Uncle Joe. <laughs> I hope Uncle Joe goes to heaven. Joe Biden, I hope he goes too. But nonetheless, he, he was trying to get their faith away from the law of Moses and put it on him. And that's what Jesus is trying to do to us right now. He's wanting you to get your faith off of whatever you've been putting it in and get it on him. Get it on him. Get it on him. Put your faith in him. That's what it means to believe on him, is to make, him, make it all about him. He's, he's where you get your rest. He's what you're relying on. He's what you're trusting in. He's what you're depending on to get you through. Amen. John 20, we're going to read some, some scriptures about believing. John 20 and verse 31. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. John 1 and 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. John 3 and 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. That's a tough pill to swallow, isn't it? He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. On all the good folks. I mean, I, I, I don't know how y'all read the Bible. But when I read the Bible and I come across these scriptures, I mean, I love all the good stuff. And I, I just, it just, whew. God have mercy. I don't slide down like frozen yogurt, you know, with Oreo sprinkles on top and, you know, the, the, the Oreo, whatever you call it. I, we had that in Louisiana camp meeting, some frozen yogurt. I can't believe they got rid of the one we had here in town on the corner by Publix. That has ruined my life here. Just about destroyed my, there's no marble slab here. There's no frozen, good frozen yogurt here. I just, I've had to pray about that on a regular basis. <laughs> the wrath of God abiding on him, it just don't, it don't slide down real easy, does it? Why would God say such a thing? Not, not just the displeasure of God, not the aggravation or frustration of God, but the wrath of God abides on those that believe not. Doesn't mean he doesn't love them. He loves them. He, he's not condemning them. He wants to see them saved. But if they go to the end of their life and they never believe, then they see wrath. God's not pouring out his wrath now. If he wanted to do that, he'd have killed all of us. Jesus never would have come. But I'll tell you why. Because it is such an affront to God to not believe him. It's an affront to him because he's done nothing but good to us. He shed his blood for us. He died for us. He, he did everything that we could never have done in a million years. He did it all, paid the price, and, and made a way for every, every person from the highest to the lowest, youngest to the oldest, and, and somebody's not going to believe that. That's an affront to God is what it is. That's why the wrath of God abides on them. And I know he's talking about people in the world, but let me tell you one thing. You are not in a good position when you just refuse to believe God, even as a child of God. I'm not saying his wrath is going to be poured out on you, but you are, you are dangerously positioning yourself in, a, in a, just a bad place when you refuse to believe God because he's done nothing but given us reason why he can, we can believe him. Amen. John 6 and 40, this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. John 6 and verse 47, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. And John 7 and 38, he that believeth on me as the scripture has said. Now there's something happening more. He said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Oh, Jesus put a whole lot of stock into believing. And that's what I'm dealing with tonight. I know some of you, where is he going with all this? I, I'm not leading you to, we're not changing our doctrine. That's not what I'm saying. We are who we are. 
But God is pointing to the believing part. Is what he's saying. He said, I know you got the Holy Ghost. I know you've been baptized. I know you're living a good life, but that don't mean you're believing the way I want you to believe because your belief ought to be moving you to action. It ought to be moving you to conviction. It ought to be moving you to win souls. It ought to be moving you to do things outside of your comfort zone. That's when you're believing. He's dealing with the believing part. Amen. Jesus said he would become their righteousness. He would become their propitiation. 1 John 2, verses 1 and 2. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. <laughs> the whole world. First John, he paid a heavy price. First John 4, verses 9 and 10, In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him, herein is love. Not that we love God, because we certainly didn't do that. <laughs> Not that we love God, because that wasn't the case. But that He loved us, and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. That word of propitiation is an appeasing. He, he appeased the wrath of God through his sacrifice. That's why he puts so much stock into believing on him because he appeased the wrath of God through his sacrifice. The folks on the day of Pentecost believed on the Lord by obeying what they were commanded to do. The Philippian jailer in Acts 16 believed on the Lord by hearing the word of God and obeying the command to be baptized. Truly, the only way we can know if we are believing on the Lord is by whether or not we're willing to obey Him. It's the only way that you can really know if you're believing on the Lord, if you're really trusting Him. And I'm not saying you can't stumble around. We've all been there. God say, do this. Uh-uh. Nope. Got to pray about that one. I don't know what you got to pray about. God doesn't spoke it. What you got to do is rest yourself in His submission. That's what prayer is about. Because you ain't going to talk to God and Him change His mind. That's what Jesus did in the garden. He knew he couldn't change nobody's mind. He knew he couldn't change his daddy's mind. But he had to wrestle with his flesh in prayer is what he had to do. <laughs> to look at, stomp it down. and <sighs> There comes a time we don't need to do that every day. If we're doing that every day, it's, it's, the, wrong, it's the wrong avenue. But there does come times we've got to wrestle our flesh down in prayer. You got to wrestle it down in prayer and submit to God. Amen. Amen. Thank God. To believe on the Lord not only means to fully trust in His sacrifice to take away our sins, but it also means to give yourself wholly to Him, completely, fully given over to Him and whatever He asks of us. In Acts chapter 8, they believed the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, and they were baptized, both men and women. Later, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Believing on the Lord never led to inaction, as it does in our day, most part. Believing on the Lord, it never led to inaction. It always biblically led to action. Action. Because God told me one time, obedience is the fruit of faith. It's the fruit of faith. If we have obedience in our lives, good indication. There's faith in my life. If we have no obedience in our lives, I don't care what you profess, confess, say, and swear by, <laughs> there's no faith in there. <laughs> it's just not there. So obedience is the fruit of faith is what it is. And all throughout the Bible, when they heard the gospel, they, they took action. Is what they, what they did. You see, and I'm coming to a close. Jesus is still the object of our faith. That's what I'm trying to get across to everybody tonight. Jesus, I know that seems like elementary, but, you know, I think we need to be reminded sometimes. Because we, we hear the news, and, and, and we look at the bank accounts, and we look at the stock market, and we look at everything going around, and, oh, God, what are we going to do? You better put your faith in Jesus. That's what you better do. You better believe on the Lord. Oh, God, it's going down. It's going down. You better go down on your knees. You better go down on your knees and pray. Stop worrying. Stop stressing. Stop fretting. Stop trying to chop everything off and down to where you're doing nothing. Do more for the Lord. When it gets darker, shine brighter. 
Hallelujah. I've seen people give their way out of situations. Broker than broke could be, but God give them a little bit of money and they just start giving it. They could have kept it for themselves, but they gave it. And that's that way in every aspect of The devil wants to get you in a corner where you, sh you just shut yourself up. And you shut yourself in. I'm not going to give. I'm not going to pray for nobody. I'm not going to go to church. I'm not going to help nobody. I've got enough problems of my own. I can't deal with everybody. Devil got you over in a headlock over in the corner. In the middle of church service, you know, you like God says, would you go over there and pray for somebody? I can't go pray for nobody. Look at my life. How can I have faith for them? I don't have no faith for them. Uh -uh. Best way to get out of the headlock is walk over there with your broke, busted, disgusted life and say, you know what? I believe God's wanting to bless you. I believe God's got something good for you. Hallelujah. I believe God's doing a new thing in you. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, somebody. That's where your blessing is. It's not in the corner wrestling with the devil. It's in stepping out in faith and believing Jesus to do something through you. That's where it's at. Lord, have mercy. That old devil, he knows all the wrestling moves. He'll put you in the figure four, body slam you, souple, all of them. Put you in that old headlock. My, my, my. Jesus, thank you, Lord. Calvary United should not be the object of your faith. Your brother and sister in Christ should not be the object of your faith, nor your religion be the object of your... No, these things are bad. But if they're the object of your faith, it's wrong. It's misplaced. I think people get so let down, so discouraged. And I, I understand hurt should not come from the church. In fact... My vision for this church is that this can, God was just dealing with me about it before service. <sighs> this is a, a home for the hurting is what it is. That's what this place is. That, and there ain't, I don't run people off. But let me tell you one thing. You start trying to hurt the hurt. You start trying to run off hurt people. This, it's not going to be good. If you can't love people here. The way they are and help them. You see, I want to, I don't care if it's hurt by sin, hurt by the world, hurt by the church. This, that's what God showed me. This is a home for the hurting. It's a home for the hurting. That's my vision for this church. That it's always going to be a home for the hurting. They can come in and be healed. They can come in and get fresh vision and get back on track with God, with the church, and whatever else they need to get back on track with. And I, and, I, and I know all of you treat people that way in here, and I thank God for that. I'm glad for that. I like to act tough, so I'm telling you right now, y'all do something or run you up, but there ain't nobody here like that. Pastors just like to talk tough sometimes, you know. But all of you have treated people wonderfully here, and I thank God for that. But even still, this church is not the object of our faith. Jesus himself ought to be the object of your faith because he's the one that goes home with you. He's the one that goes to work with you. He's the one that goes to school with you. He's the one that heals you, delivers you, and sets you free. <laughs> I'm not just talking about salvation tonight. I'm talking about believing on the Lord every day in your choices, in your lifestyle, in your family. Are you really, I, I know, I understand the church world, I'm just, you know, the trusting Jesus, it, they've made it so, I don't know, they abused it in a certain way. But, but there's truth in that. Are you trusting Jesus? Are you really trusting him with your finances? Are you trusting him with your future? Are you, it'll show up in your actions far more than your words. You know where my trust in my wife shows up? When she can go out of town and I don't blink an eye. I might call her 40 times, but it ain't got nothing to do with lack of trust. I just miss her. I want her home. <laughs> That's what their mom was in Louisiana somewhere, the campgrounds, I guess. Her mama made another call. Well, my God, you done called her three times. You won't leave her alone. It's because y'all are a bad influence on her. That's why. I told her we got to fussing and fighting that first night in the parking lot, went over there. She had it in her mind where she wanted to park, and she didn't tell me. And I knew where I wanted to park. So we, it wasn't nothing screaming. We'd walk in church happy as can be, loving each other. But in that parking lot, we had it out. And I said, I said, look, I don't know what this Louisiana spirit is on you, but we're going to get you back over to that Florida spirit. 
It's a lot better over there. We're going to knock that off of you. Oh, Lord Jesus. Get around that mom and them sister. She gets strong. I'm just picking. But she can walk out of here and she can be gone for the next six weeks. I don't want her to, but I ain't worried about it in the least. But I'll go to bed every single night sleeping peacefully, not worried about where she is or what she's doing, knowing that she's coming home. And you see, when you trust in Jesus, even though you can't see him, put your hands on him, hear his voice, you just know, it's all right, he's coming. He'll be back. He knows where I'm at. He loves me. Let's all stand. You know, it's one of the many things I love about Jesus, and I, we always say the one thing, but we say that a thousand times. So it's one of the many things I love about Jesus. We talked about it in Monday Night Prayer, is that prayer is everywhere. It's down at the convenience store. It's in your car. It's in your home, in the bathroom, living room, bedroom. It's outside in the backyard. Just They can't take prayer away from you. Can't be taken away from you. And if you're going to believe on the Lord in your daily life and truly trust Him, you better be praying. You better be talking to Him. You better be communicating with Him. Because you don't trust people you don't communicate with. You don't know them well enough. You don't know who they are. You don't know what they're up to. You don't... But when you talk to people, you get to know people. Amen. Thank God. Is this all right tonight? Not preaching a new doctrine. But I think as apostolic, sometimes we leave out the believing part. I think we bypass that sometimes. We put a whole lot of stock into what we do and how we do. But what about believing on Him? Truly trusting Him in your everyday life. Everyday life. Let's worship the Lord in Jesus' name. Father, we love you tonight, Lord. God, we give you glory and honor tonight, oh God. We exalt your name. Help us to believe on you. As the scripture has said, that out of our bellies would flow rivers of living water. Lord, that we would believe on you in every day in our finances, in our, our homes, our families, and everything that we do, oh God. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we give you glory. God, we exalt your holy name tonight. Lord, help us to believe on you, God, by obeying you, by trusting you, by, by giving you our full weight, the full weight of all of our problems, by releasing them into your hands. Does somebody want to believe on the Lord tonight by coming to these altars and just saying, Lord, I'm giving this to you tonight. I'm tired of carrying it. It's too heavy for me. I can't, I can't handle it. And so, Lord, I'm going to believe on you by giving this to you, and I'm going to go home, and I'm going to sleep, and I'm going to sleep well. I'm letting it go, and I'm giving it to you in Jesus' name. And these altars are open if you want to come and pray. They say this mountain can't be moved. They say these chains will never break. Don't know you like we do. There is power in your name, and we've heard that there is no way through. And we've heard the tide will never change. They haven't seen what you can do Cause there is power in your name So much power in your name Move the immovable Break the
God we believe No matter what to help you. <laughs> if you want to know how to believe on the Lord, the next time you want to do something, or God wants you to do something, and you don't want to do it, when you do it, there's no more perfect picture of you believing than when you're doing that. <laughs> because it goes beyond your emotions, beyond your feelings. It's a pure act of faith. When God tells you to do something, and you don't like it, you don't agree with it, it don't feel good, none of the above, but you know he told you. And when you do it anyway, in spite of all those things, you are probably never believing more than when you do that. I know we all love the goosebumps, tongue talking, shake around, feel good, and then you'd go do it, but 
Sometimes it's about as dry. Nowhere God's not inside. It's just a simple act of faith. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Let's worship. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight, Lord, for your goodness. We thank you, God, for all of your blessings that have rained down on Calvary United. We thank you, Lord, for the wonderful things that you've not only done, but that you will do, God, in our future. God, we ask you, Lord, to touch all those that have been given to the building fund and helping with that. that God, that you would grant them increases on their jobs and their finances. Lord, that you would bless their efforts, God. And Lord, those that are in this city that need a place where they can be healed from hurt, God. I pray and ask, God, that you would help us to find them and that you would draw them into this house, oh God. In the name of the Lord, help us to believe on you by trusting you and obeying you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So glad the Figueroa's are here tonight. Amen. Amen. We're going we're gonna to be seeing a lot more of them, so uh, if you will, just make yourselves known to them after church tonight. They came about a, uh, maybe a little less than a year ago, and uh, so, but they, they've been around for a while, and so they asked if they could start coming here. I said, absolutely, absolutely, and so we're excited about them being a part of Calvary United. Amen. Amen. They didn't make an, a quick decision. I like those. I like that kind of situation. Amen. People don't make a quick decision, but they make it over time in prayer. Uh, also, with Sister Michelle's situation, uh, well, I'll ask her to put the address to the property. It's off of Auburn Road, a little bit north of Crestview, and uh, for Saturday morning. Like I said, if some of you can go out Friday evening, just do a little bit of work then, that would be fine. Or get with her uh, and see what you can do, when you can go. Uh, but for those of you that can go Saturday, I would say 9 o'clock in the morning, if you're just... The address will be on the messenger page, and you can just meet us out there at 9 o'clock. Uh, if you're not on the messenger page, get with me or Sister Michelle, and we'll help you with that. All right, God bless you. We're dismissed in Jesus' name. If you want to be